Hello friends, this is Arthur Woods, the resident artist of Greater Earth, and this is Communication 16013. Welcome. Well, as you can imagine, we are totally ecstatic about the successful launch of the Geopolitical Observatory. The launch went as expected, and the art official satellite was placed into its proper orbit. In its first week of operations, it has been sending a steady stream of information to receiving stations here on Earth. This data stream can be seen on the Geopolitical Observatory page on the Greater.Earth website. Just go to the menu and under Interventions, you will find the link to the Geopolitical Observatory page. There, you will find a table of information that is being regularly updated as new information is added to the data stream. The latest information is always listed at the top. As you will see in the first week of operations, we already have about 40 topics added to the data stream. Well, on the right side, there is a column, and there you can see the various categories of information that the satellite is tracking. Geopolitics, of course, but also specific topics such as the economy, war, peace, science, the environment, climate, etc. We are working to make uh, these categories more accessible as each topic will soon have its own data page. Well, what we can already observe is that the situation on Earth is getting very tense. The information about geopolitical developments and war developments totally outnumber the positive news that we've seen. Interestingly, most of the positive items that we have collected so far have to do with space and space development. Well, each week, we plan to highlight one or more significant pieces of information that has, come, that has come into the data stream. To give you an example, I would like to single out one of the listings from our first week of operations. It is by James Corbett, an independent investigative open source journalist living in Japan. His Corbett report has been online for a number of years and always adds real clarity to a broad number of issues affecting society. This past week, he posted an article called The Real Cost of the War of Terror. The title caught my eye because it didn't say the war on terror. Well, as James posts his work under the Creative Commons license, which permits distribution, I'm integrating his article into this communication. So let's watch it now, and I will return shortly. You're listening to The Corbett Report. We all know by now that the real terrorists, the politicians in the suits and ties and the banksters that pull their strings, are waging their war of terror on multiple fronts, for multiple reasons. Domestically, it rallies the population around the flag, keeping the flock in check. At the same time, it justifies the buildup of the police state control grid to catch the thought criminals who resist. It also writes a blank check for the illegal wars of aggression abroad. Simply place your terrorist boogeyman in the square of the chessboard you're looking to occupy and, hey presto, you've got yourself an excuse to invade. Even if you accidentally end up supporting them. Right, Uncle Sam? But of course the politicians, their string pullers, and their fellow travelers benefit from the war of terror in a more straightforward sense. They get to use the terror scares that they themselves create to drum up billions upon billions in the name of fighting the boogeyman. We've all heard of the $640 toilet seat and other ridiculous examples of Pentagon overspending, but these stories tend to trivialize the abuses by the military defense contractors whose entire industry is built on providing overpriced solutions to made-up problems. After all, the Pentagon itself just admitted it could cut $2 billion from its budget by shutting down some of the needless bases and defense facilities that have been built around the globe in the name of the American Empire. But $2 billion is chump change. In the 15 years since 9-11, $1 trillion has been spent building up the police state in the American homeland itself. Meanwhile, the Defense Department has been spending over $600 billion per year maintaining the American military in the post-9-11 era. Four to six trillion dollars of that was spent on the Iraq and Afghanistan wars alone, the most expensive wars in U.S. history. Combined defense spending, including Homeland Security, DOD, State Department, defense-related debt interest, and other defense costs, 
have reached the highest levels in modern history over the past decade. From a Cold War era high in the 1980s of $3,500 for every man, woman, and child in the United States, to a 1990s low of $2,500, the figure has since breached $4,000. Just look at the chart. It isn't hard to see exactly when the trend reversed and the good times began to flow for the military-industrial contractors. It was 9-11, the birthday of the War of Terror and the new era of homeland security. There are other numbers we could throw in here. The billions upon billions in military aid sent to the co-perpetrators of the War of Terror, including the $38 billion that has been promised Israel over the next 10 years. The $1.5 trillion joke known as the F-35 fighter jet. The $6.5 trillion of year-end adjustments in the ongoing, never-ending saga of the Pentagon's missing trillions. But we have to be careful not to fall into the psychopath's trap. The real costs of the War of Terror cannot be measured in dollars and cents. They are not tallied in a ledger. They are not about money at all. The real cost is paid in blood. The blood of a million dead Iraqis. The blood of the hundreds of thousands of murdered men, women, and children in Afghanistan and Pakistan. The blood that is being shed right now in Syria, in Libya, in Yemen, and in all of the countries that have crossed through the crosshairs of the NATO, American, and Israeli terrorists. It's measured in the devastation of towns and cities that once bustled with life. In the families torn apart by drone bombings. In the havoc of the hundreds of thousands forced to flee their homes, leave their families and their homeland and their former life behind, as everything they knew is torn to shreds. It's measured in the blood of the servicemen and women themselves, lied to, propagandized, and indoctrinated their entire lives, given a ticket out of grinding poverty by the military, shot up with experimental vaccines, and shoved into the meat grinder for tour of duty after tour of duty. And then, upon returning home, left to rot in run-down hospitals and ignored by the glad-handing politicians and their military-industrial cronies as a suicide epidemic gradually thins their ranks. This is the true cost of the War of Terror, and it is incalculable. And none of it, absolutely none of it, will come to an end until the public stops believing the false narrative of the War of Terror and the lies that have brought it about. Much like Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny, the real terrorists can only survive if you believe in them. Well, that was incredibly informative. And as you know, there is an issue that comes with military spending because the military industrial complex has become one of the most profitable industries in the world. And because of this, it exerts much influence on our political leaders and their policies. Well, here is another video we picked up from CNN where journalist Wolf Blitzer is interviewing U.S. Senator Rand Paul, who wants to halt arms sales to Saudi Arabia. As you will see, Blitzer accuses Paul of having a moral position which would cost Americans, guess what, jobs. Let's watch. Into law, he would presumably veto it. At the very least, it begins the debate of whether or not we should be at war. We are refueling the Saudi bombers, so we are essentially part of the bombing campaign. We're helping them choose targets, and we are refueling the Saudi bombers that are dropping the bombs. It is said that thousands of civilians have died in Yemen because of this. Yes, we need to have a debate over this, and I don't know what the president will do, but he ought to be come, come to Congress and ask for permission. We've given him no authority to get involved in the civil war in Yemen, and we have to ask the bigger question, is this making it better or worse? Are there more refugees or less? Is there more chaos or less chaos with Saudi Arabia bombing into Yemen? So, yeah, it's a debate we ought to have, and no president should unilaterally have this authority without the approval of Congress. So for you, this is a moral issue, because you know there's a lot of jobs at stake. Certainly, uh, if uh, a lot of these defense contractors stop selling uh, warplanes, other sophisticated equipment to Saudi Arabia, they're gonna, there's going to be a, a, a significant loss of jobs and revenue here in the United States. That's secondary from your standpoint. Well, not only is it a moral question, it's a constitutional question. Well, there you have it. Again, we hear the argument that so many jobs and our economy depend on these weapon industries. 
It appears that our society has become dependent on the production of the tools and technologies designed to kill and destroy. I guess one could say that humanity really has become addicted, but as we know, addictions are usually not healthy. However, it's not only an American affliction. Here in Switzerland, we have the same problem. In the headlines this year, it was pointed out that Switzerland annually exports about $450 million or 450 million Swiss francs of weapons each year. Now, due to their policy of neutrality, they place certain restrictions on the exporting to nations involved in conflicts. And this year, there was a, a major discussion about the export of some $50 million worth of weapons to Saudi Arabia, currently at war in Yemen. However, Pressure from the industries and the lobbyists convinced our political leaders to relax this restriction and to let the sale go through because so many jobs would be affected. It should also be noticed that the largest defense contractor in Switzerland is partially owned by the Swiss government. Ludwig from Mises, the free market economist, has written that War prosperity is like the prosperity that an earthquake or a plague brings. The earthquake means good business for construction workers and cholera improves the business of physicians and pharmacists and undertakers. But no one has for that reason yet sought to celebrate earthquakes and cholera as stimulators of the productive forces in the general interest. He goes further to say that wars are harmful not only to the conquered, but to the conqueror. Society has risen out of the works of peace. The essence of society is peacemaking. Peace, and not war, is the father of all things. Only economic action has created the wealth around us. Labor, not the profession of arms, brings happiness. Peace builds, war destroys. So what is the solution, and what has this to do with space and greater Earth? Well, on the greater.earth website, we have a page called Space Solution to Terrestrial Problems. There you'll find a list of terrestrial problems and a corresponding list of space solutions. And one of these solutions that we suggest is to transform the military-industrial complex into the space-industrial complex. I would like to share another quote with you. This one is by longtime space advocate Frank White, who is the author of the influential book called The Overview Effect, in which he describes a cognitive shift in awareness that was reported by some astronauts and cosmonauts during spaceflight, often while they were viewing the Earth from orbit or from the lunar surface. He writes, War and space exploration are alternative uses of the assertive energies that are so characteristic of human beings. They may also be mutually exclusive because if one occurs on a massive scale, the other probably will not. Now let's think about that for a minute. If there would be a major world, a major world war, a World War III, due to the sophisticated and lethal nature of today's weapons technology, such a war would probably be the last war that humanity would ever fight as it would become the end of civilization as we know it, and of course, any chance of ever having a space program. Indeed, we would be looking at a new Stone Age. Whereas if we could channel our energies into opening the space frontier, using many of the same skills and technology that we find being used today in the military industries, we could create a space age instead. Thus, we, humanity, has to make a decision do we want a space age or do we want a stone age? If we choose a space age, how do we make that happen? What do we do? How do we change our destiny, which seems to be coming closer and closer to a point of no return? Actually, we need to transform the military industrial complex into the space industrial complex. We need to create new space industries and projects that would employ all of those currently working in the industries of death and destruction so that we can finally get rid of that argument that wolf blitz are made. In an upcoming communication, I would like to share with you an art intervention that could symbolically and practically make a difference. It's called the Space Peace Star. And as you see, it has its own website, which you can visit at spacepeacestar.space. 
You can read about it now if you want, and I will definitely talk about it in more detail soon. Okay, that's it for today. I need to get back to my preparations for my flight to the Greater Earth Space Station. I will soon be getting on that space plane that you see behind me, and I definitely have some additional training to complete. We had two successful launches in September, so it looks like we are in really good shape for my launch in the very near future. In the meantime, we will be monitoring the data stream coming down from the Geopolitical Observatory, and we will share important topics as they appear. Don't forget, you can stay up to date with the data stream by accessing the Geopolitical Observatory page under Interventions on the Greater Dot Earth website. Okay, this has been Communication 16013. Thanks for watching. This is Arthur Woods. Goodbye for now.